Hello everyone, and welcome to this mini-lecture on Ralph Waldo Emerson and his essay, Self-Reliance. So before we get too far into it, I really like this image. Uh, it, is a, it is a statue uh, of a man chiseling himself out of stone, and I think this is a great visual of the idea of self-reliance, of the idea of the self-made man. And this is an idea that, that's central to Emerson. Um, it's a major idea within American literature as a whole, but we see with self-reliance it, it becoming a very strong and, and evident theme uh, throughout Emerson's work, as well as when we get into Henry David Thoreau and others. So Ralph Waldo Emerson, he was born 1803, died around 1882. Um, he's really, he, he's a major voice in American literature. He's right up there with people like Hawthorne and, uh, and uh, Walt Whitman, and certainly a, a important figure to understand if we're going to understand American literature. So he's born in Boston, um, he attends Harvard, and he eventually becomes a Unitarian preacher. So he has a you know he has a a back a ed educational background. He also has a spiritual background, uh, and that makes him you know makes him a, a a centerpiece or eventually becomes a centerpiece of the transcendental movement. And that movement was influenced by the European Romantics such as Coleridge and, and Wordsworth. Um, and the transcendental movement that he's one of the major voices of is this, you know, it's this trend, this response to religion and culture and society. Most movements are those, you know, respond to those things. But in this case, with transcendentalism, um, Emerson, among others, were, you know, the, at, at their core was a drive for individualism uh, coupled with idealism and that th the concept being that the the belief in yourself um, in, in truly investing in yourself does reap rewards for the entire society there's a lot of um, what there's a lot of Emerson ideas and transcendental ideas that eventually morph into what eventually becomes objectivism. Um, objectivism takes different turns, but th there's certainly overlap between there. Also within transcendentalism was a challenge to the religious views. Uh, there was questions and challenges about religion as an institution, religion as a whole. It, or I should say Western religion, because a lot of the transcendentalists did take from, borrow, or were enlightened by Eastern religions, such as Buddhism, Hinduism, Taoism. Transcendentalism also had within it a fierce connection to nature and the world around, and you can see that in a lot of Emerson's work. You can see that in Henry David Thoreau. I mean, he goes out into Walden, you know, he goes to Walden Pond and tries to live, you know, by himself in a natural environment without other people for two years. So, Emerson is the, the really within the United States, he, he's one of the major voices, the major and influential voices coming out of transcendental, transcendentalism, and he's somebody we still read today, that people still look to for inspiration. And so, he is a major shaper of that idea of the American, of the individual um, on that first page within this presentation you may have saw you know there was a it was essentially a cowboy um, it was the image of a cowboy and that that again that I the rugged individualism that we see in the Western in the cowboy uh, is something that ties back to Emerson so we're going to take a look at self-reliance uh, it was an essay written in 1841 we're just going to take a look at a couple passages that I really want to trace out or that I want you to be thinking about as you get into the text, as you look at some other readings within this course, and as you think about American literature as a whole, because this, a, a this is a very important essay um, in the large picture. To believe your own thought, to believe that what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men, that is genius. This is a very interesting quote, you know, Emerson is saying that that to have that faith in what you feel and to know that all 
all people, he says men, will extend to all people, because we should, um, that to know that truth of yourself and to know that others can do this, um, that is genius. That is, th that being able to bridge the gaps between people means being able to recognize the trueness and the, the, that, that piece of you that is you. Um, I think it's a very profound thing. It's, it's saying it's our individual trueness that makes all of, it, all of this true, that makes us able to connect with everyone else. A man should learn to detect and watch the gleam of light which flashes across his mind from within, more than the luster of the firmament of bards or in sages. Yet he dismisses without notice his thought, because it is his. In every work of genius we recognize our own rejected thoughts. They come back to us with a certain alienated majesty. So, he's talking here about the rejected self, that many of us have these great ideas, or not even initially what we think are great ideas, we just, we have these insights, we have these ideas, and we disregard them. In fact, we disregard them, but we quickly take up the advice, or we take, to quickly take up the ideas of bards and sages, that is, other people, that is, you know, whether it's, a, whether it's an intelligent person or it's Dr. Phil. Uh, I don't mean to say Dr. Phil is not an intelligent person, but he's, he's a pop psychologist. He's there for entertainment, and people take up his advice um, and believe it has luster, rather than looking at and intern internally looking for their own answers. And so, you know, yet he dismisses without notice his thought because it is his. So we disregard our own thoughts or the ways in which we have ideas, and yet every time we see somebody that's a genius, what do, you know, we see this a we see this alienated majesty. That is, we see something that's familiar and regal, and we say, hey, there's something about that that would that I had thought of, but I had disregarded it, and so I am no longer, you know, I don't get to be the genius. I get to be the person looking at the genius. So again, this idea of kind of looking inward and holding to your ideas and holding to your view and really fostering that self-knowledge. There's a time in every man's education where he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that he must take himself for better, for worse, as his portion, Though that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his toil. Bestowed upon, uh, bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. I love that I, that 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 uh, the, the language here. That you know, at the conviction that envy is ignorance. Right? To be to envy somebody is to be ignorant. That imitation is suicide. That to imitate somebody else is suicide. What does he mean by that? Well, in this case. To imitate someone else is to try to be like them. And if you're trying to be like somebody else, you are killing yourself. You are removing that which is you and aspiring to be somebody else. And I think it's a great, it's a great thing to think about in our, in our media-rich environment how much we aspire to others. And yet, in doing so, we, we kill a bit of ourselves. You know, I think there's a lot to be said about the value of this when we look at things when we look at things such as, um, you know, teens and adults who have body image issues, who disregard the beauty of their body and aspire to be, you know, the the extremely thin and often unhealthy, you know, s typical model. Uh, that there's something to be said about what. Emerson is saying here in valuing yourself, in valuing who you are, in tilling your own soil. That is, finding those things that you are good and that you like and making sure you hone them and not trying to hone somebody else's soil. Whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. Non he who would gather the immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Absolve, absolve you to yourself, and you shall have the suffrage of the world. Whoso, sh whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. 
right? That to be an individual or to be, you know, in this case I'll say human because man is. There's, I have a lot of problems with saying man in this sense because it's it's true of all people. As he who is to be a fully developed human must be nonconformist, right? Cannot just go with the flow, right? He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness. All that means is, as a man or as a human, if you are to be a full-fledged human, you must be a nonconformist, and therefore you cannot just go based upon what is told to you to be good. Right? So think about this. Think of, this is in the 1830s and 1840s. What is good at that time? Or what is acceptable? Or what is okay? Well, slavery is okay. So to be a nonconformist, you don't just say, well, slavery is, you know, slavery is good, right? It cannot be hindered by the name of goodness. Slavery is going on and people seem to be okay with it, so it must be good. No, you have to explore if it be goodness. So, is it really good? And how do you decide that? And what do you do about it? Nothing is at least sacred but the integrity of your own mind. So, you have to challenge the beliefs. You can't just blindly say, oh, this is good because everybody else said it's good. You have to determine what is good and right. And you have to test that. And you have to question that. You can't just accept it blindly. What I must do is all that concerns me, not what people think. This rule, equally arduous in actual and intellectual life, may serve for the whole distinction between greatness and meanness. It is harder, because you will always find those who think they know what is your duty better than you know it. It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinion. It is easy in solitude to live after our own. But the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. I love that imagery. The, the great man is he who in the midst of the crowd keeps with perfect sweetness the, keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. So, again here is this idea of not getting lost in what others say or what others do or what others believe but holding fiercely to your beliefs but not just holding fiercely to it and going off and living in your own little world but holding fiercely to those beliefs in the midst of society we are social creatures to go off and live on your own and saying you know I believe this and therefore I will remove myself from society that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily, that won't make you great. Um, in some ways, as, as Emerson says, it may make you mean. And in this case, it's not necessarily mean as in like being bad mean as we talk about today, but uh, making you average, right? Remember, mean can also mean average or common, right? If, you, if you're working in math, you have, um, when you talk about average, you have mean, median, uh, and medium. So we have meanness here that you know mean that refers to being average. The the other terror that scares us from self trust self trust is our consistency, a reverence for our past act or word because the eyes of others have no uh, have no other data for computing our orbit than our past acts, and we are loath to disappoint them. Again. Here's a fascinating one, and one that I think we witness most with family. And that is our the thing that we are afraid of is being inconsistent, right? Particularly with our family. You ever notice when you're with your family, you fall into roles? I've been guilty of this. When I'm with my family, there's a certain role that I play. And I play that role in part because that's who I am with my family and they have no other they have no other data for computing my my orbit other than my past acts and I don't it's hard for me to break out of that pattern I certainly do or I certainly try to but I think this it's a good example of trying to you know develop our self-trust and, and step away from our consistency recognizing that we do change and that change is part of our growth and we need to trust in the change that happens 
So here we have one of his more famous quotes. Uh, a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds, adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines. With consistency, a great soul has simply nothing to do. He may as well concern himself with the shadow on the wall. Speak what you think now in hard words, and tomorrow speak what tomorrow thinks in hard words again, though it may contradict everything you said today. Ah, so you shall be sure to be misunderstood. Is it so bad, then, to be misunderstood? Pythagoras was misunderstood, and Socrates, and Jesus, and Luther, and Copernicus, and Galileo, and Newton, and every pure and wise spirit that ever took flesh. To be great is to be misunderstood. So again, he's saying, if you are true to yourself, you are apt to, at times, be inconsistent, and that's okay. Being consistent to things that are not important, that are irrelevant, or that are not useful is a hobgoblin, is a, is a, is something that only little statesmen, philosophers, and divines stick with. That to be great, you sometimes do have to be contradictive. That to be great, you do, you will have conflicting thoughts, sometimes day to day, sometimes hour to hour, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, that's, you know, according to, to Emerson, that's a sign of, you know, potential greatness, is that you're working through, if you're being true to yourself and you're looking inward and you're trying to understand everything about you, there's occasionally going to be contradictions, and that's okay, that's what happens. To be great is to be misunderstood. But now we are a mob. Man does not stand in awe of man, nor is he genius admonished to stay at home, nor is, is his genius admonished to stay at home to put himself in communication with the internal ocean. But it goes abroad to beg a cup of water of the urns of other men. We must go alone. Again, the, this idea of we, we quickly have a hive mind, a social mind, which is important i think i think emerson and the transcendentalists will often dismiss it there are some values to this there are some important things to this that tie into our overall wiring and the ways in which we can and hold on to community but at core here is not giving up of yourself you can notice he does say at the end we must go alone that is we must still become a group but we must be a group of individuals not a mob of you know one mindless cohesion be it known unto you that henceforward i obey no law less than the eternal law. I will have no covenants but proximities. I shall endeavor to nourish my parents, to support my family, to be the chaste husband of one wife, but these relations I must fill, fill all after, a new and unprecedented way. I appeal from your customs. I must be myself. I cannot break myself any longer for you or you. If you can love me for what I am, I shall be happier. If you cannot, I will seek to deser deserve that you should. I still seek to deserve that, deserve that you should. I will not hide my tastes or aversions. I will so trust that what is deep is holy that I will do strongly before the sun and moon, whatever inly rejoices me in the heart appoints. So again, he, you know, he, he's arguing for this idea of that, that eternal law, the self-belief, the self-trust, um, and that because of that, he can have no co covenants, right? I, I, that's essentially saying I, I make no pro I make no promises but proximities, and I like that. You know, he's saying I make no promises, but I will do my best. I'll endeavor to nourish my parents, to support my family, to be chaste, to my, to, uh, to be the chaste husband of one wife. But these relations I feel after new, I, I feel after a new and unprecedented way. I think in a, in a very important way, he's saying I will not. Actually, we see this really well. If you ever get to read uh, Kate Chopin's The Awakening, the Edna Pontier has this great line where she says, you know, I would, I would sacrifice my life for my children, but I would not sacrifice me. And, and that's not the exact quote, but that's the gist of it, is that, and, and it's what Emerson is talking about here, willing to, you know, sacrifice 
a for and care for family and love, but not give up the essence of who you are. That's a death of another kind, and that's not one that he's willing to submit to. It's one that Edna in uh, Kate Chopin's The Awakening would not submit to. And I think it's an important one, this idea of, of losing yourself or giving up yourself. And so not you can't make promises in that, or you can't make promises in that context in the sense that if if a loving partner tries to subsume you, tries to make you believe what they believe, as opposed to care for them and nourish them and things like that, then there is you know then you're dealing with imitation, then you're dealing with that suicide, that that death of the self. Uh, if you are noble, I will love you. If you are not, I will not hurt you. In myself, be, hip be hypocritical, uh, in myself, by hypocritical attentions. If you are true, but not in the same truth with me, cleave to your companions, I will seek my own. I do not, I do this not selfishly, but humbly and truly. It is alike your interest in mine, in all men's, how, how long we have dwelt in lies to live in truth. Does this sound harsh today? You will soon love what is dictated by your nature as well as mine, and if we follow truth, it will bring us out safe at last. But so you may give these friends pain, but so you may give these friends pain, yes, I cannot sell my liberty and my power to save their sensibility. Besides, all persons have their moments of reason when they look out into the region of absolute truth, then they will justify me and do the same. So again, it's this idea of I, I I'm making a promise of, of self-love, of of self-trust. I am I hope that you do the same. If in doing so this leads to different paths for us, I'm okay with that. We are both the better for it. And this may be harsh, but in the end, it will be of value. It'll be of value to you. It'll be of value to me. So again, this idea of if if you search for your own inner truth. It then gives opportunity for your greatness, and if that leads you away from people in your life, you know that they're that's that's too bad. But it's also for the better of everyone. All right, so that's a a brief introduction to Emerson with uh, lots of different things to think about. Hopefully, this gives you some good work or some good ideas to think about in looking at self-reliance. And also, I would encourage you um, to look at American Scholar by Emerson, which also has a lot of these ideas with them. All right, thank you for listening. See you in the next video.